can call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 4th, 2024. We have an overview from the staff today of uh, system-wide impacts on hospital budget requests and recommendations. There won't be deliberations or motions today. These are just the staff recommendations. And then there's been an email sent out to hospitals and VAS as to when hospitals are likely to have their individual budgets um, reviewed by the board, deliberated by the board, and motions made. Between now and then, there's some additional information coming in from hospitals in response to board questions. So um, that information will be received and considered. There could be slight changes in time depending on when information is received from hospitals. Uh, it's a fairly dynamic process, um, as it's pretty quick. But we plan to stick to the schedule as best we can that was sent out by board staff to the hospitals, um, subject to when we receive the information that's been uh, requested in follow up. Um, I'll briefly apologize for the delay this morning. We had a technical issue with some of the state, um, I don't know what the exact words are, but administrative permissions prevented us from being able to use the, the links. Apparently, there's um, a changeover statewide on August 30th that changed all the permissions and, and messed up the links today, and we couldn't have the um, backup recording for the court reporter. So I apologize for the delay, and I won't delay it further, and I will turn it to Ms. Barraby for her presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this will be a collaborative effort. Um, there's a team of very hardworking individuals behind me that have helped um, help bring this together today. Um, and we'll, oh, I should share my screen and we can dive right in. Can you see the slides? Yes. Great. All right, so today um, we're going to walk through what we've heard in terms of public comment um, related to affordability in hospital budgets. Um, we're going to review kind of the impact of the budget requests that came in for fiscal year 25. Um, and then I will um, review a summary of staff recommendations thus far based on the information we have. And as Chair Foster mentioned, we may we're still waiting on some information from hospitals um, that that will be considered as when it comes in. Um, and then Friday and Monday, we will review hospital budget requests um, in more detail. So, you know, this is again kind of at the summary level, and we will dig in and explore many of these concepts in more detail um, in the coming days. So I want to start with public comment. I'm going to have Noah and Emma help us kind of sort through some of these because there were there were a lot um, and they were um, really important and I think you know we've heard from a lot of folks over the last several months um, and as healthcare continues um, to um, become more unaffordable. Um, so Vermonters are really paying attention to healthcare. It affects all of us. Um, 171 public comments were received. Um, this included public comments that came specifically through the GMCB's hospital budget review and rate review processes, um, as well as comments received through Act 167 community engagement work. Um, and it highlighted many concerns about affordability and kind of a need for a system level change. Um, specifically, Vermonters are really worried about rising costs and unaffordability of health care. Um, access to local services and tertiary care, um, as well as kind of the ability um, of our current situation and being able to control um, some of these factors. Um, and then we also heard from hospital employees and providers in support of hospital budgets. Um, of course, that is also an important perspective um, to consider. So I'm going to turn it over to Noah and Emma to kind of walk us through some of these um, quotes that we heard. We wanted to share with you um, more specifics on what we were hearing from from the public. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah. I'm a policy analyst here at the board. Um, I and Emma will switch off reading these public comments. Um, first, Vermonters are tapped out. Being a single dad of three, I can't afford this. Emma, do you want to read the next one? Yep. Um, Vermont has made it nearly impossible for small business to do business here. Now the cost of business is too high to stay here. Deductibles are so high on affordable plans, I'd rather pay out of pocket when needed. Patients delay care, which ultimately raises health care costs. 
We're bleeding healthcare providers out of the system because it's untenable. What individual gets anything close to a 19% raise each year? How is an individual expected to pay for this increase in health insurance? I currently have a $9,000 deductible and yet pay $740 per month, half of what I pay for rent. For that amount, I receive only the most basic preventative care and a slight discount on bills I pay out of pocket. Where do these increases stop? I expect Blue Cross Blue Shield will get an increase regardless of what the public says. I expect I will be paying more for a higher deductible and less care. My nonprofit organization provides coverage under both of these plans to support the health and well being of 43 employees and their families. The cost of health insurance has continued to place a strain on the organization's budget, which has led to underinsured families and staff turnover. Increasing the cost of health insurance through the marketplace will put additional strain on children and families served by the organization, who often have limited income and tight budgets. Healthcare costs are already out of control. Taxes will be going up, now healthcare, but my salary doesn't seem to have the same raises. People will have to choose between taking care of their health, living in a decent house, or eating enough already. As a small nonprofit employer committed to providing fair wages and benefits to our employees, we continue to be challenged by double digit increases in health insurance rates. Over the past five years, we have switched plans and insurers several times, moved to high deductible plans with health savings accounts, and have had to increase employee contributions. This makes it more complicated as well as more expensive for both our staff and for us as an employer. Continuing increases are simply not sustainable for our institutional budgets for our staff or for our ability to continue to operate with staff here in Vermont. I am an owner of a small business here in Burlington for over 20 years. We offer our employees 100% healthcare coverage and $100 per paycheck to their HSA. We are so discouraged by the rate increases for healthcare here in Vermont. We have seen it consistently go up for decades by 10 to 12% a year. Now our premium has gone up 25% and reporting that it will go up another 20% in 2025, then who knows how much after. Vermont has made it nearly impossible for small business to do business here. Besides the high rate of taxes, healthcare costs are some of the highest in the country. As a family plan, we still have a deductible of $8,500. This is insane. We cannot afford to offer this benefit to our employees and give them the salary they need to live here. I want to know what we can do about this. It is already hard to attract talent to move here because of the cost of living. Now, the cost of business is too high to stay here. Um, so we also received a large number of public comments from um, hospital providers, um, physicians, and hospital staff. Um, as a reminder, part of our job here at the board is to balance the concerns of Vermonters about costs with uh, hospital concerns about their ability to uh, provide care. So we've included two comments here as well, just to show that, that we're taking them seriously too. Um, so this first comment, UVMC is an integral part of the health care that is provided here in Vermont. Many resident physicians, after completing their training at UVM, chose to stay in this area to continue to practice medicine. UVMMC, as an academic medical center, is integral to providing a great portion of subspecialty care that would otherwise not be available to Vermonters. An academic medical center such as the UVMMC is at the forefront of healthcare innovation and research, which are both necessary for the advancement of the field of medicine. If it were not for UVMMC, many Vermonters would be forced to seek specialty care beyond state lines. I use health services in both the Rutland and Springfield areas. In 2019, one week before my second child was due, Springfield Hospital closed their birthing center where I had planned to be. Not only was this a dramatic change, but it was made without sufficient time. I was shifted to Dartmouth where I did not know any of the phys physicians or practices. It was incredibly stressful. Since then, services in our communities have continued to decrease with our Ludlow walk-in clinic closing their weekend hours when they are most needed. We are losing services that keep people out of the ER. Thank you both. Um, <clears throat> that it's a lot to think about, um, and it's affecting a lot of people. So I just, you know, I think we wanted to make sure we were all kind of 
aware and hearing um, these stories, which are so important because, you know, we have quantitative data, um, but it doesn't often do um, justice of what people are actually feeling in their day to day lives. Um, so now we'll transition to more of that quantitative data and looking at the impact of FY25 budget requests and summary of staff recommendations. I don't have to keep telling you, but we have an affordability crisis in this state. Um, it is harder and harder to um, afford our health care. Um, and as you know, um, the most recent uh, premiums that were approved um, by this board, um, it was really hard, hard pill to swallow. Um, we understand that there was a um, kind of insurance solvency issue, and that led to a lot of um, kind of a approving rates higher than we may have otherwise wanted. And we know this affects a lot of people, but um, it's starting to feel like we're kind of falling apart at the seams um, and really keeping moving forward in a way that we feel like we're making progress. Um, as of 2020, and these I know are outdated, but you'll have some new data um, in a few months when our expenditure analysis is presented. Um, but we were spending approximately 19% of our GDP, um, of our state GDP was spent on healthcare. So um, a lot has happened since 2020, and you'll see a lot of our data kind of end 2020, 2022, when we have more comparative state data. But we know that we've had since then quite a bit of growth um, in our state compared to other states. Um, the cumulative average change to QHP rates um, continues to be huge. Um, as you know, you approved 20, you know, uh, double digit increases this year for both MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, despite, you know, taking it down a bit, it was still um, a large, a large growth. Um, and our state has, you know, in the 1990s, though, we were kind of the you know, underspending compared to other states, perhaps. We were in the lowest decile. Um, now we are consistently ranked in the highest decile in terms of per capita healthcare spending. Um, and in 2020, we saw this dip, but we know that compared to other states, um, we saw a greater decrease in spending um, during that period of time. Um, and given our our most recent growth rates, we're likely to kind of be back in that top decile. Um, these data come from the uh, the NHG or the National Health Expenditures data um, that Medicare puts out. Um, and so they're updated every five years. We'll know more about how that shakes out next year. Um, and as you know, hospitals are a major component of healthcare spending. Um, if we look at it just in terms of total healthcare spending, and again, these data are from 2020, our spending was about 35% of Vermont's residents' total healthcare spending. Um, but if you look at just Vermont providers, hospitals receive approximately 47% of healthcare revenue spent within the state. Um, if we look at kind of our growth trajectory um, compared to FY17, so that's when we started, we implemented the all-payer model. If we trended that forward um, at three and a half or 4.2, you can see the red and the purple lines um, kind of going up at a gradual growth rate. Um, and then the bars, the gray bars are the budgeted amounts, um, the blue bars are the actual amounts. So you'll notice in 2020, there was quite a, a reduction compared to what we had expected before the pandemic. Um, that budget was approved before the pandemic had um, arised. And then over time, this growth has um, kind of exceeded that three and a half um, to 4.2% um, growth year over year. Um, the pink uh, the pink bar chart is the projected from 2024. The orange is the guidance that was set for 2025. And the green, and apologies, they don't show up on the legend, um, is for the requested amount from hospitals in 2025. Um, and just a reminder, you know, when we think um, about kind of hospitals' ability to stay financially healthy and earn, earn a margin, which is really important. We want our hospitals to be healthy and to be able to invest in equipment necessary to serve patients with high quality care. Um, what, what we really need to think about is how price interacts with volume and how our expenses um, are shaking out. And so the more that you can kind of bring in, so price times volume kind of determines revenue. This is, you know, there's lots of ways we contract, but this is kind of the gist in the fee-for-service world. Um, less expenses equals a margin. So the more, the more you're able to control your expense growth, 
um, also the more you're able to raise your prices or the more you're able to address volume and, and serve patients in your community can affect the margin you're able to bring in. Um, there are also other ways hospitals can earn a higher margin outside of patient care delivery. That includes investment income, grants and other program revenue or kind of write-offs and kind of the accounting behind the scenes and how you're managing those expenses. Um, so, you know, as we're kind of looking through this and thinking about how, you know, there's not a one for one with affordability, but having an impact on affordability really comes through how many services we're using and at what price. Um, and we know that we have an access problem in the state um, and we also have a price problem in the state. So in some of our areas, we're kind of in the 10th, 9th and 10th decile across inpatient and or outpatient. Um, and this is quite high compared to many other states in the country. So if we continue to grow volume at these super high prices, it's going to be no surprise that our overall spending growth um, is going to be astronomical compared to other states. And this is why, particularly for a state that has access challenges, and we want to see increased volume and increased access to care, that we really need to be careful about how we do that um, in relation to the prices that we're charging for those services. Um, operating expense growth has been a has been a challenge also in Vermont. So this is compared. You've seen this slide before, but compared to other New England states, um, Vermont is that teal line, and you can see that we kind of have been near the top in recent years and kind of um, growing um, at a higher rate and kind of contain continue to be towards the top. So we know New England um, suffers kind of from many of the same challenges of um, kind of cost of living, et cetera. Um, but you know we're we're at the top there um, in terms of our statewide hospital operating expense per discharge. So that's how much we're spending um, in term per patient at a hospital. Um, but it is also really important, as I mentioned before, to consider the health um, of our hospitals. So when we're kind of pulling these recommendations together, we also looked at who can, you know, not only affordability and trying to make sure that we're kind of living within our means or at least trying to get towards living within our means, um, but we want to make sure that where we're allowing growth and where we're kind of um, uh, kind of kind of curtailing capping growth is really going to make a difference in, a, in that community and that um, we're going to, you know, um, consider this in our recommendations as well as price um, and volume. All right, so I will pass it to Mark to walk us through some reminders on the statute and the rule that is guiding um, this process. Hey, good morning, everybody. So just for, for some clarity, what I'm going to do today is, is really try to couch the staff recommendations in relationship to the benchmarks. What I'm not going to do is move through an exhaustive statutory description like I did about a month ago. Um, if we need to do that again later for board memory, we can. But my hope here is to give you a little bit of a shorter rundown just to refresh everybody's recollection on benchmarks and to set the stage for how staff have been evaluating. So for background, the board must establish a budget for each hospital by September 15th with a written decision by October 1st. When establishing a budget, the GMCB relies on its statutory charge and the state's regulatory objectives. And again, a description of those objectives are in the presentation slides that Elaine and I did at the beginning of August. Under GMCB Rule 3.306, hospitals bear the burden of persuasion in justifying their budgets as submitted. If a hospital doesn't meet its burden, the board must adjust the budget such that it aligns with the state's regulatory objectives, which means that the question for the board is obviously whether the hospital has justified its budget. That's the, the, the question. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. So with that in mind, we use benchmarks to act as a helpful starting point for everybody. The board may establish benchmarks under statute. Um, the, the board can establish a process to define on an annual basis criteria for hospitals to meet, such as utilization and inflation benchmarks. That's 18 VSA 9456E. 
And the board establishes those benchmarks for hospital use in developing budgets by meeting with VAS and the HCA to obtain input, holding public hearings, taking comment, and then providing benchmarks to hospitals by March 31st, which is what we did this year. Benchmarks, again, help the board consider whether budget adjustment is necessary, and they give the hospitals clear notice as to what the board is looking at as a starting point for hospital budgets. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So what I will do is I will read the benchmarks, and there is a lot of text, and I do apologize for that, but these are really important, so I want to make sure we all have them in full. We had three benchmarks this year. The first benchmark was net was about net patient revenue. So here's the benchmark. Growth in net patient revenues for hospital services is benchmarked at the system level at an amount of 3.5% over the FY24 system-wide approved budget in line with the total cost of care growth target in the Vermont all-payer model. For the purposes of this benchmark, the growth rate is allocated across hospitals at an equivalent rate though the board recognizes that it may be appropriate for some hospital budgets to be above or below the system-wide target. For budgets that request NPR growth exceeding this benchmark, hospitals must provide justification, including credible and sufficient supporting evidence that the excessive growth reflects an improvement in access or quality of care. For example, increased access as justified by lower projected wait times and a means to achieve them, population growth as justified by demographic trends and projected increases in new patient volumes, etc. In evaluating proposed budgets, though this target is relative to current year budget, staff will also consider hospital prior year actuals and projected current year performance relative to the respective NPR growth budgeted for these years. For any hospital with material differences between budget and actual or projected NPR, FY23 or FY24, the GMCB expects the hospital to address that variation as part of its justification for budgeted FY24 and FY25 NPR. So that's net patient revenue. That's benchmark one. Uh, next slide, please. Benchmark two was commercial growth. So this is commercial rate growth or negotiated rate growth. Um, uh, I'll just read it. Commercial rate growth by payer shall be no more than the PCE price index plus 1% as of January 2024 over FY24 approved budget, which amounts to 3.4% for FY25. The GMCB anticipates establishing a cap on any commercial rate increases for each hospital, which will also apply as a cap on the increase that the hospital may receive from any individual commercial payer. Any GMCB approved rate increase is a cap subject to negotiation between a hospital and commercial insurers and is not an amount set or guaranteed by the GMCB. Hospitals proposing budgets that exceed this growth rate will be required to justify this request with sufficient and credible evidence of hospital efficiency and maximize productivity of resources. For example, average work RVUs per clinical FTE by department, both the level and the associated percentile of national benchmarks or similar, measures of hospital cost and efficiency used by leadership to assess operational efficiency, both the level and the associated percentile of national benchmarks are similar, et cetera. And then the third benchmark slide, operating margin. Hospital financial stability may help Vermonters maintain access to essential services. While there are many indicators that are important for evaluating financial health, a key metric for private entities is operating margin, as it expresses the ongoing ability of an organization to cover its operating costs with its expected revenues from operations. Hospitals proposing budgets with margins at or less than 0% will be required to explain key drivers of their sustainability challenges and justify with sufficient and credible evidence of hospital efficiency and maximized productivity of resources. For example, average work RVUs per clinical FTE by department. I, I won't uh, that one is I won't read that one again. Uh, measures of hospital cost and efficiency used by leadership to assess operational efficiency, both the level and the associated percentile of national benchmarks or similar, et cetera. Operating margin, a hospital's operating margin shall be greater than zero. The board recognizes that achieving a positive operating margin requires generating sufficient revenue, managing expenses and expense growth, and performing efficiently. So again, a lot of text. I do apologize for that. But if we go to the next slide, I, I think I can turn it back to you, Elena. But here is a, a breakdown just for 
the sake of your eyes on those three benchmarks in shortened form. Great. Thank you. Um, right, and I dropped this in, so I don't know if it's on the um, web yet, but I'll make sure it gets updated. I just wanted to kind of reflect on the um, metrics that we used in establishing guidance. So um, as Mark mentioned, the, we relied on the personal consumption expenditures um, or the PCE price index. Um, as you noted from the previous slide, it was based on January 2024. If you look at the slope of the line, it's much steeper um, than where we've been for the last four months. Um, so actually inflation has come down quite a bit. So I just want to kind of preface this by saying there's, um, you know, I think the way that we set guidance this year is, if anything, quite generous, given kind of where we are in this current time and assuming that inflation continues to kind of level off. Um, you know, it was we were in a high inflationary environment before, but um, thankfully that is that is slowing down. So I wanted to put this up um, for some context. Um, this is a summary of the hospital budget requests. I focused on NPR growth and commercial price growth. Um, operating margins not on here. I think operating margin everyone kind of estimated to be above zero, except for um, the exception of one hospital that we know kind of um, fills um, their budget with some um, fundraising. So essentially they would be around or just above zero. So I think we can focus on NPR and commercial price growth. Um, only one hospital came in, um, Mount Scutney, meeting um, the, all the benchmarks. Um, so they requested a 3.2% NPR growth. This came down from an earlier version because there was some CON-related um, spending in that estimate. So that's why that now was just above the threshold. Now it's below the threshold. Um, but other than that, either we had hospitals that um, exceeded the benchmark on NPR or exceeded the benchmark on um, commercial price growth. Um, so you, you have seen these. I'll explain what the columns are to the right, but I'm not going to read you all the numbers. Um, so the column, so we have the first column is the NPR request. So this is how much their total patient service revenue is growing from FY24 budget. Um, as was outlined in the guidance. Um, the second column, um, the verse G, is how that request compares to the uh, total dollars of NPR um, that were kind of allowed to them give, you know, in guidance. So if they were growing to guidance, what is the difference between what they requested in guidance in terms of dollars? Um, the third column, compares this in a percentage point. So you can see kind of the magnitude of the overage or under, in some cases hospitals came in under. Um, and then the third, the fourth column um, is a little confusing, but I was trying to give you guys a sense of the relative magnitude that each hospital was over the guidance. And so some of those hospitals you might see like Brattleboro um, has a negative one because they were under the guidance. So they would relieve pressure from that total overage um, at the statewide level. So you'll see that that sums to 100. Um, and we did the same kind of analysis for commercial price. So the um, this column just to the right of the commercial price request shows the total dollars that the hospital is over or under in terms of the guidance established, um, the 3.4%, um, the consumer price growth. And then we compare um, in terms of the magnitude or a percentage um, to that, to guidance, and then as a percent of the system. I'm happy to answer questions as we go, but... Um, I'll keep going along if there if no hands are up. Um, this kind of looks cumulatively since before the pandemic. You know, I think a lot of the discussion that we've had in recent years is making sure we shore up the system. Um, you know, we there was a crisis. We lost a lot of revenue. Hospitals were struggling when we, they couldn't see patients to stay afloat, and that was one of the major challenges of living in a fee-for-service world is being able to kind of adjust and accommodate those downturns. Um, but if you look from, so fiscal year 19 um, actual, so where we were before the pandemic um, to what has been requested today, that would be a $1.3 billion addition in six years, um, or approximately 48% cumulative growth rate. That would shake out to an average growth rate of 8.1% um, a year, or a CAGR, which kind of smooths that over time, or just under 7%. 
Um, and then if you look at the two columns to the right, that kind of breaks those estimates out into two chunks, one from 19 to 2022, kind of around the COVID and COVID recovery years, and then from 22 budget to the 25 request. And you'll see that the majority of the growth um, is really happening in the, the most recent three years. So um, moving from 5.2 to 8.4% um, or approximately 27% growth rate from 2022 to 2025. Um, as uh, Mark mentioned, clinical productivity was one of those um, kind of points of justification we asked hospitals to include with any requests over guidance. Um, Hospitals submitted these um, using their own benchmark data. Um, Ten hospitals submitted rates of clinical productivity based on RVUs. They came from a variety of sources, so it's kind of difficult to compare apples to apples in different peer groups. So that's kind of an area we're exploring um, for future years. But based on those data, 68.4% um, of reported clinical FTEs are performing below the 50th percentile in their respective benchmarks, and 70.8% of reported departments are performing below the 50th percentile um, of their respective benchmarks. So we summarized based on the hospital's data that they submitted um, kind of what we were observing at the system level. And again, only we only have 10 because only those hospitals that didn't meet the price benchmark were required to submit these information. OK, um, so now I'll break it down. We'll, we'll be talking about enforcement from FY23 because that's an important consideration when establishing the 25 budget. But I wanted to show you kind of the staff recommendations with and without that enforcement so you could get a sense of um, kind of the logic behind it. Um, so staff recommendations, again, you know, we're really trying to get the system to um, kind of trying to control the growth at the system level, recognizing that we do have an, a need to expand access to care and that that will come with volume. So we want to make sure that we're doing that and that the system's prepared to do that um, in a way that's not going to exacerbate the affordability crisis that we already have. Um, so what you'll see here is um, for each hospital, we have the commercial um, growth request. So it would be, so based on the information submitted, that would be adding $102 million um, to, to the system um, or approximately 5.7% um, price growth. And so this is not accounting for volume. This is just the commercial price growth component um, of NPR. Um, the staff recommendations kind of really tried to bring everyone close to benchmark, um, especially given kind of the inflationary, you know, where our inflation is kind of coming back down, um, with the exception of Copley um, due to some uh, days cash on hand and financial um, stability challenges. So again, we'll go in more detail um, hospital by hospital uh, Friday and Monday, but I wanted to share this with you. Um, and then the two columns on the right are comparing the staff recommendation versus what the hospital requested um, and versus what we established in guidance. So you'll notice that um, the recommendation comes pretty close um, to what guidance um, had asked hospitals to do. Um, enforcement. So. Um, Enforcement, you, you heard a little bit about this in the spring. Hospitals were notified if they triggered the enforcement policy for potential enforcement. Um, the board then kind of weighs and evaluates whether and how much to enforce um, based on the information that we gather through, through this process. Um, so hospitals were notified. Um, they submitted letters and additional information. And then there's some information kind of um, coming back to us. Um, in response to some follow-up questions during the hearings, so that's still outstanding. But um, based on the information we have right now, um, staff are recommending not um, not enforcing against NVRH given kind of everything their community has endured and their kind of financial um, challenges at this time. Um, uh, enforcing in part partial enforcement for Porter and Rutland. Um, you know, they expanded access to care and and their prices aren't you know, super low, but they're kind of they're not on the super high end either. So we thought it was prudent to allow some growth there. Um, and then UVM, we propose we're proposing enforcing in full given um, super high prices, but also some um, windfall that kind of occurred that wasn't budgeted for um, either through um, over 
estimating expenses that didn't pan out or underestimating revenues that could have been used to offset that commercial price increase. So again, we'll go into more detail, but wanted to present this to you that would effectively be a, a commercial reduction of uh, negative five at the system level. Um, and you can see how that shakes out across hospitals. Um, this is a recent history of commercial rate approvals. I think part of the challenge with enforcement and in this process is like how much rate do we need and no one has a crystal ball and can tell exactly what the volume will be this year and you know how much rate we need. But you know the the further away our estimates get on volume means that we could potentially be giving too much price. Um, that's one explanation. And so I just want to remind folks that in 2023 this was a really big year for commercial price growth. I know we had a lot of concerns around hospital financial health, um, but you know I think part of that could just be you know volumes were still coming back up. We didn't quite know how much, um, and so I just want to put this here. Staff are kind of trying to build a understanding of cumulative rate growth over time, and we'll hopefully have something for you soon. Um, but wanted to remind folks of those the history of commercial rate approvals. Okay, so when you bring this all together, adding up the two previous slides, um, that would leave us with a commercial rate um, impact at the system level of almost negative 2%. Um, and so you would kind of net the staff recommendation with the enforcement mechanism to arrive at kind of a final number that would be reflected in the budget. And it, this chart follows the similar um, kind of approach as the previous slide, so I won't explain all the columns because they're similarly calculated. Um, okay, and then net patient revenue, um, as I mentioned before, you know, we do understand there are, you know, access challenges. We saw that in the public comment. We hear about it all the time. Um, and so we are not recommending to reduce NPR commensurate with price. Um, we would expect that, um, you know, being able to reduce price will allow us to serve more patients while still managing um, to a lower, to, you know, managing our growth over time. Um, and so what that looks like, so we did uh, make some assumptions to try to get everyone closer to guidance and then allowing growth either in those lower cost areas or where there is really that pent up demand and trends we've seen over time. Um, we did compare NPR, the staff recommendation to what was requested to guidance and then to what is currently being projected for 2024. So you can kind of see that, um, see how that shakes out. Okay, and I'll turn it back over to Mark. I think believe he'll walk through some of the motion language. Yeah, happy to. And a reminder that the motion language presented today is in template form and for the purpose of giving comment. It's not to be used by the board today for, for uh, uh, bringing forth motions. We'll be doing that again on the 6th and the 9th. So I have two suggested motion templates. The first is this one, which is an approval with modifications, and the second one will be an approval without modification. So suggested motion language for an approved budget with modifications. Uh, move to approve hospital's budget with modifications as follows. One, with FY25 NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than X percent over its FY24 approved budget, reduced from whatever it was the hospital requested, and a, com and, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. That line is, uh, I think, almost identical to what we had last year. Uh, two, with FY25 commercial negotiated rate growth capped at X percent over the FY24 approved commercial rate cap, reduced from whatever the hospital requested, with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount, Again, that tracks the benchmark. And three, subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. And a note there that we will be presenting on uh, proposed or recommended standard budget conditions on the 6th and 9th. The board will have an opportunity to hear those, to weigh in on those. And at the current moment, we anticipate the board voting on those standard budget conditions on the 11th, which is when we'll also do votes for individual hospital budgets and enforcement. Uh, so that one is, is wrapped. If you can go ahead to the last slide, Elena. Oh, it might not have made it on there. 
Um, that is fine. Uh, let's see if I can briefly pull it up. Just give me one moment, please. There we go. I think I've got it. Appreciate your patience for a moment there. And I'll do it this way. You see that okay? All right. So this is uh, suggested motion language for uh, approved budget as submitted. And you'll notice it's very similar, just minus the modification language, but I will go through it just so you have it. Uh, move to approve hospital's budget as submitted. One, with FY25 NPR, approved at a growth rate of not more than X percent over its FY24 approved budget. Two, with FY25 commercial negotiated rate growth capped at X percent over the FY24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. And three, subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by the board. So that's the uh, that's the second template. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get that incorporated into the presentation that's up on the website if it's not there already. All right, that's it for me. And that's all we have today. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster, in case there are any questions. Uh, thank you both very much. It was really helpful context and a deep dive from a system perspective, and I appreciated it a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I guess just thank you for putting in all that effort to present this to, to everybody. Um, one just kind of technical question on slide 33, which was the slide with the historical rate increases. Yes, let me pull that up. So we're all talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think I got the right side. Um, do you know off the top of your head whether this includes mid-year increases? Um, if Matt Sutter is online, I'll have to get back to you. I believe it does. Yes, um, it looks like yes. it does. Yes. Okay. And then just so I make sure I'm reading right, the <clears throat> hospitals where the name of the hospital is in black and bold on the left, those are the ones where the numbers reflect change uh, yes. in charge. So the hospitals bolded and black are the ones that are subject to potential enforcement for fiscal year 23. So sorry, card yes. three, there's a lot going on. So the colors, the red and the blue denote super you know, higher versus lower rate. Um, but then the black, the bolded lines are those um, that are being considered for enforcement. Okay, so if I go to 2023, so there's two different things going on. <clears throat> there's change in charge and there's commercial effective rate. And so yes. if I want to, so for, let's take UVM in 2023, that 14.77 is the commercial effective rate, not the change in charge, right? Yes, because there are subsets. So the network hospitals have this commercial effective rate that historically has been approved instead of change in charge. That's correct. But then Rutland for 2023 is in black. And so Rutland's number reflects a change in charge, not a commercial effective rate. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, that's all I had. I just wanted to make sure I got that one right. Um, any other board member questions or comments? I have some, but I don't need to go first or second if other people have some questions. I think you're up. Okay, uh, slide 14. Um, so what impact does the uninsured rate have on the state's position at, in the deciles? That's a great question. Um, we can look at that um, or at least look at a correlation. I don't know that we would know exactly how much that would 
impact it without being able to separate uninsured spending versus not. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but I was sort of thinking less specifically and more generally. Yeah, we could look at that over that period of time. Okay. It was just notable that in the 90s, uh, for example, 99, 1995, VHAP was implemented big jump in spending, which you would expect when you implement new coverage programs. Right. Um, and similarly, Dr. Dinosaur is probably that first bump. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I, I want to be clear, there's no um, kind of um, not projecting that spending at the first decile or second decile is a good thing. Um, this is just looking at a distribution of spending. So there could very well be, we could have been underspending in those earlier years. Yeah. Sure. And because it's a decile, per capita decile, isn't, doesn't that bring in other states as well? So if we're in a decile, we're in a decile with other states. Am I understanding that right? Yes, it, it kind of buckets states based on their spending that's more similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So what led to my question is, for example, that there was news not that long ago that the U.S. uninsured rate just dropped below 8%. Vermont's been below 8% since uh, the 2000, since actually I think maybe 2005. Um, we're currently at three. So in comparing our, our total spending per capita to other states, I think recognizing that some of the good things that we've done historically in terms of coverage will make us be higher than many others in this country who don't spend that money on the uninsured, mm -hmm. either Absolutely. in Medicaid or other places. Um, on slide 16. Um, the three and a half to four Point two here is NPR growth from 17, not yes. total cost of care. Yes, NPR growth. Okay, great. I just was curious because it didn't look like it matched the total cost of care spending that we've been reporting to the federal government. So trying to just understand that yeah. piece of it. Um, and is 4.2, I think our, if the 3.5 to 4.2 is based on the APM targets, Yes, and that is the same growth rate that um, was approved in guidance um, by the yeah, board. Okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, my next question, I think, was on slide 30. Uh, two. Um, 32 and 33. So, uh, well, let's start with 32 in terms of the enforcement. Um, so when you talk about partial versus full enforcement, could you explain what you mean? Yeah, so for Porter and Rutland, I took half of what their, um, what their total overage was beyond the, um, the 1% that we, that, so, First, we look and compare how much, so that third column, how much they were over, right? So our policy says if you're 1% over, it's open for um, potential enforcement. The amount subject to enforcement is to the right. And then for those that are partial, um, we did half. Um, there's a number of ways that you could arrive at that half, whether it's about fixed versus variable costs or, you know, I was thinking about price. Price is very salient, um, but these kind of get you kind of to the same place. Great. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to get um, some historical information about enforcement. I don't recall ever using just NPR as the dollar to derive the dollar amount for enforcement. Um, some of that's quite old, so maybe difficult to to find. But mm -hmm. certainly, like my recollection is that we looked at other factors, for example, um, margin um where the dollars came from commercial versus medicare uh but again many of those enforcement actions were very early when i first started on the board right. so they might be quite old at this point but uh, since we as a board haven't talked about an approach to enforcement i think it would be helpful to also have the historical context um so that we can understand kind of the variety of potential approaches 
Um, on slide 34, actually slide 35. Um, so I, I totally understand your rationale for not um, doing a dollar for dollar reduction in NPR commensurate with a reduction in the price recommendation, but I think it would be helpful to have that impact because, for example, and maybe it's just me, <laughs> which totally happy if it's just me. Um, it's difficult for me to understand then, like if we're reducing, let's say, Porter by the recommendation of nine percent, but approving a three point five percent increase for budget to budget, what then is the the potential utilization growth mm -hmm. percentage there? Yep. Because for example, they're 7.6% over, uh, I mean, they're 7.6% under in their projected to current, or to this recommendation, which is a, a lot of room, just if yep. you think of it from a utilization perspective, that number I'm assuming is higher if we were to approve the staff recommendation on 34. So for me, because I do wanna understand this interrelationship between price and utilization, having that price impact on NPR, total NPR would be helpful because it gives me a sense of how much NPR growth would have to occur just on utilization in order to hit the staff recommendation. Yeah. If and that I think makes sense. Yep, that that exists in in this slide right here, but we oh, can great. so that's that commercial rec versus requested. So that's the NPR value. I think we could add that um, for you to the net patient revenue. Um, yeah. Right. I would yeah. rather not have to subtract it out of the NPR rec and recalculate the percentage myself if at all possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then uh, my other, so I had a question for Mark on um, the motion language. So historically, as was noted in the slide, we've approved change in charge. So I think it should be clear, clearer in, I guess that's why you're saying negotiated rate growth, right? So you're saying this is the commercial effective rate we'd be voting on? Not the yeah, change that's in exactly charge. Exactly right. This would be commercial effective, not change in charge, consistent with the uh, second guidance benchmark. Okay. Will we know what that translates to to a change in charge? Because the change in charge does impact the non-commercial uninsured market, for example, um, and self-pay. So having it, and yeah. quite frankly, Medicare and. Uh, like what they have to report to Medicare and yes, other those things. Are, those are very fair questions. I think what staff and I can do is go back and, and work to get the board either that language updated in this template or appropriate language in the standard conditions to cover that issue. Thank you. A question. That's all I had. Thanks very much. Any other board member questions or comments? This is this is Tom. I have just one um, one question, and just first, um, thank you, Elena and staff. Uh, this excellent analysis and presentation. Um, and as I've kind of listened through the the morning, um, it's clear to me that prices have grown very fast. That was slide fourteen. Um, productivity. Uh, is relatively low. That was around slide 30. We've heard that it's difficult for hospitals to hire clinical staff, physicians, primary care specialists, nurses. Um, yet there's the budgets, and I, uh, I'm wondering if you could pull this slide up at slide 29, I think. Um, we're 1.3 billion over pre-pandemic. The budget requests are 1.3 billion over pre-pandemic um, levels. Um, yet we have hospitals, the majority of our hospitals are in the red. 
So that 1.3 billion is being spent, but it doesn't appear to be being spent on clinical care. So where is it being spent? If you could help with that over the next few days, that'd be great. That's all. I have a quick question. You could leave the same slide up. That's fine. Um, so this addresses the 48% growth in cumulative, or well, it's, it's a cumulative growth, but the NPR is 48% higher in requested 25 over 19 actual. We're talking about enforcements, all the enforcement uh, suggestions from the staff come on the commercial price side. Why not consider enforcing on the NPR side to undo uh, some of that 48% growth? What What's the logic of not doing both NPR and, and price for enforcement? Um. I guess I'd have to understand what you mean in terms of NPR. So I think there's a couple things going on. One is the money is spent. It's not like we can go back and and take that money back. We, there are no there are no clawbacks in our process. Um, I think the the other thing from a more policy lens is really if we're talking about access to care and that we're we don't have the access to care that we need across our state, making sure there's room. Um, I think we don't want to just say go forth and drum up all the access you want. We need to make sure that, you know, we're not, our prices aren't overinflated relative to that to still kind of balance that out. Um, so I think, I think leaving room makes sense given our access challenges. Um, we just don't want to see access growing at super high prices, super high unnecessary prices. Um, I don't know if that gets... Well, I'm not. I'm not talking about clawing back money, uh, but some of this money was one-time windfall money, uh, and so uh, what my question is more of rebasing NPR uh, so that the NPR isn't growing such that you know this 48% growth, those insurance rates don't come down; they continue to grow higher. So I'm just, and I and I appreciate the context, which is. Which is, I think, what you're saying is that to ensure that we maintain access in the state to care, um, we would consider not trying to rebase the NPR, even though the NPR was spent vastly above the budgeted approved NPR. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Any other board member questions or comments? Great. Can I ask a, a clarification? Dave, were you speaking specifically in terms of the um, the windfall one time to the UVM enforcement? I didn't recall that from at least Rutland or NVRH. I, I was so speaking. I can go back and reread it. But I, just so I, I was speaking to enforcements in general. Okay. If there's a if there's an approved budgeted amount and the NPR grows substantially more than the approved budgeted amount, uh, exceeding growth targets, uh, especially on the commercial side, uh, there, you know, um, we want access to be good, um, but we don't want those insurance rates, those commercial insurance rates to continue to rise at the rates that they have. And now they're quite high. So my question was more of a general question about uh, enforcement because it's an NPR overage. Why not think about it on NPR as opposed to commercial price and what the rationale is for that? Thank you for the clarification. So 
Remember, just to make sure I understand what you're suggesting is if we use the enforcement in differently from what the staff recommended and do part of it on NPR, we ultimately have a greater protection for Vermonters and the solvency of our insurers because the total amount of dollars going out the door would be capped and would be less versus the staff recommendation here for us to discuss later this week, which is let them keep the NPR, but lower the prices so that they have more runway to increase access up to that amount. So what you're saying is move that amount lower to protect the consumer and insurers, right? I'm going to hedge a little bit and say that I'm not saying to do it, but I'm curious why that wasn't um, part of the staff recommendation, which I think I'm getting some clarity on, but I think it's I think it's a consideration that we should think about. I also want to point out that we did reduce NPR from requested, right? So I really we it's a little bit higher than guidance, but it is lower. So I think, you know, thinking about whether that is enough or whether you would want to see more. So it's it's kind of a relative, you know, so you could theoretically be taking it out twice. Like I we took it back closer to guidance, as you can see here. Um, so if you if you would feel like that is not enough protection, I guess you could think about increasing that reduction. Thanks for the insights. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any comments they may have. Hello, good morning. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief today. Mike or I will give a more uh, robust comment on during deliberations on Friday. But I just want today I wanted to thank Elena and the staff for a really impressive presentation, all the hard work uh, you put together. And I also particularly wanted to thank you for highlighting Vermonters' lived experience um, and, and the experience of, of folks with small businesses and, and living in Vermont and the access to, chair, access to care challenges um, that folks have been experiencing. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll take public comment via the raise the hand function. Mr. Del Treco, good morning. Good morning. Um, sorry that you had so many uh, technical difficulties this morning. It's never never easy. Um, I I've I have I think I have three questions slash comments. I'm not sure which they are, so we'll have to sort of run it out. Um, the first is around enforcement. Um, uh, it, um, partial versus full, the 1% threshold on consideration. Um, do we consider those that are under and over or just over? Um, and then more specifically, I thought the 23 and 24 was a two year process. So um, on growth, so how do we know what to enforce in 23 when 24 hasn't happened? Um, my my memory might be a little fuzzy there, but I thought those were a two, it was a two year uh, cycle. So there may be some um, un, uncertainty on what's in the twenty four space. So so that's um, enforcement. Uh, um, and before I get into the next one, I, I do think there's an order of. Uh, uh, thank you to the, the team for putting some of this together. This is confusing stuff. And I found some of the charts to be, the labels to be difficult to understand. I didn't know what dollar sign R meant. Uh, I, the, so those are a little bit confusing and the nomenclature has changed, but that's maybe that's my problem. But on the utilization and, and price side, I think many of the uh, charts can be commingled with both price and utilization and we know we have some some often some challenges on what we mean by price and what drives gross charges versus cost and things of that nature but I won't get into that but I think on slide 35 and 29 specifically um and maybe on 29 is what of that one point x is is utilization versus price and what what's driving some of these things before we 
um, make make some decisions um, in that in that space. Um, and then uh, uh, to member um, Lunge's comments around slide 14. I know that Elena and staff and and uh, Chair Foster we had a discussion around understanding some of the policy drivers in the state of Vermont that has actually put upward pressure on our um, deciles and per capita spends. I think it's an, I think we've made some pretty pretty um, uh, great moves uh, in our policy space and some of it is um, some are some are our Medicaid expansion uh, move, you know and, and uh, uh, the, you know those sort of things that have have had upward uh, pressure. So um, I hope I'm I'm being clear here. I, I'm, I'm trying to react to the slides real time and I and I think the ask the uh, the last thing uh, these are you've pointed out in the beginning of the conversation um, that you want to work carefully towards understanding impacts and implications. I think we need to understand all of the moving moving pieces on operating margin uh, and projected days cash on hand uh, as we evaluate these uh, not only enforcement but recommendations on the on the uh, the budgets themselves. So thanks for the opportunity to speak and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, and we um, intentionally put up our staff recommendations earlier this year than I think we historically do so that we would have more time to, to get feedback. So thanks for people who attended and are participating. I think in past years, we would put up the staff recommendations and deliberations on the same day. And so this year we want to be um, a lot a little more time for feedback. So so thanks for doing that. And Mr. Del Truck, I think I might be able to answer one question, although I'll reserve the right for my lawyers to correct me and discuss with you. Um, but I think the two year question, your first question related to the guidance period and the enforcement question relates to the actual budget orders. So the budget orders versus the guidance might be the, the distinction there. But um, I think the enforcement relates to the budget orders. Okay. Um, Thank you. And then I think actually I have the second one too. The you asked about some of the symbols. I think the R um, was requested and the G was guidance. So it was a comparison yeah. of requested versus yeah. guidance. Yeah, I, I got that as we went through and got the explanations. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Vincent. Uh, good morning, uh, Green Mountain Care Board staff and members. I just have a comment uh, to make. Uh, just seeing this. Um, Presentation um, this morning, um, um, the the staff recommendations. Um, uh, again, just a, a comment. Um, so we are very proud of the work uh, to deliver what our patients, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, and other stakeholders have asked of us, which is to increase access to care while minimizing the impact on commercial insurance rates. As a result of this effort, we have reduced wait times and backlogs to needed services which both increased revenue and increased expenses in 2023, something the board and its staff have known for months, including through real-time reports on actual experience in FY23. We are deeply concerned by the Green Mountain Care Board staff recommendations to impose detrimental penalties against UVM Medical Center and Porter Hospital for delivering the care Vermonters needed. Punishing nonprofit hospitals for providing care to their communities will hurt the very people we are here to serve and undoubtedly negatively impact access to care. We recognize we're in a particularly challenging time in healthcare delivery and financing in our state on an unsustainable path. The actions recommended by staff today will further destabilize our safety net system of care for years and years to come. The necessary impacts on services we provide will have lasting impacts on Vermonters, and we want to make sure the board is aware of the significant and negative implications of what the staff have recommended today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, and I, I'm not 
current as of this moment, but I believe there is still some additional information coming in from the network regarding enforcement, I think. So we look forward to getting that and um, we appreciate your speaking up. Any other public comment? I um, appreciate everyone participating. And again, our staff, it's an immense, immense, immense amount of work on hospitals and the staff. And I really, really appreciate everyone's efforts so that the board can try and make the best decisions possible for the state, given everyone's acknowledgement, which I think is really important that this is a really, really difficult time for the state and for the providers and the patients and the insurers. So. Um, I have nothing else, and we look forward to hearing any other comment that people may have. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I will move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 And we adjourn. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.